Good evening and welcome to Real Talk with me, Azania, on the eve of the 24th anniversary of our democracy, celebrating the mark that made a difference. What a track to start the show off on. It's certainly on a celebratory tone. That was Hip Hop Pantola with PJ Powers, and that was the remix to Jabulani. When I say the name Penelope Jane Dunlop, you might not immediately know who I'm talking about, but if I had to say PJ Powers, immediately you all know it's the one and only Tandega, the one who is loved by everyone, and she's here in studio tonight. She's been in the industry for close to 40 years, but not without her fair share of ups and downs. But this woman, I must tell you, is fearless and she's a survivor. Now, later on, we'll also be joined by author and professor of sociology, Christy van der Vestesen, to talk about the place of white Afrikaans women in post-apartheid South Africa. And with that, I'd like to welcome my guest, PJ Powers. Thank you. It's so lovely to see you again. Isani. I'm so tempted to say Painello. Painello. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of an inside joke yeah. because you and I yeah, worked We had on, a lot of fun. Yeah, we worked on a singing competition. Yeah, Danny we Benito judges. was with us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and Zwei Bala, of course. Yes, of course. And we started calling you Painello. Painello. Instead of Penelope. Mm. Yes. Has it stuck? Or it, is it just the mindset? No, it's just you and, <laughs> and Jewish. Are you... <laughs> <laughs> and the term jewels. And the jewels. That, I'll yeah. tell you, has caught on. Yeah, a lot more people are using yeah. it. Yeah. But we had fun, didn't we? We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. It was a tiring show, but um, I laughed a lot. Yeah. yeah. I really did. So, my friend, I'm really glad you're here today. Thank you very much. Especially it's because to be we'll here. be talking your latest music. But you know, when people talk about you, they compare you to Stevie Nicks of Fleetwood Mac. Oh, really? Yeah, and people even say that you're like the female equivalent of Johnny Clegg. So when you look at the 80s particularly, mm -hmm. what are some of your fondest memories of that era? I think the fondest memories that I have of the 80s was the originality of the music, the solidarity of the music. You know, it was, we were going through one of the most violent times in our country. Um, and it, it brought with it obviously a lot, a lot of pain and a lot of angst and a lot of um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, marginalized uh, people, and, and, and it, it was a horrible part. But from a musical point of view, it was amazing how um, musicians, we really, we, sh we shared a, a, a common yeah. enemy, and we, um, it depended which side of the fence you were on, of course, mm -hmm. but, and it was a, it, it, there was an amazing camaraderie, you know, when myself and, and Brenda and Johnny and, um, Abu Kwanyana and Sipu, uh, uh, Mabuse yeah. and Jaluga, we all used to roll into the townships and, and, and do shows. And it was, a, a, you know, 60, 70,000 people and, wow. and, and bring some wow. kind of relief and some kind of hope yeah. to people who were living in, in the most disgusting, disgusting mm. circumstances. So what do you think of the music today? Because the artists that you mentioned, even your own music, there was such a profound and deep message that spoke to the time of the day. So when you listen today, what do you think? I think that there's some that I, 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 I thank you for putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I know artists always try and avoid yeah, look, their truth, but probably privately say, listen to this. Rubbish. No, I'm too honest for that. You yeah. should know me. <laughs> um, you know, I think that there is, there's some stuff that's come out that, that really has made me go, wow. Hmm. But I think that we could certainly go further in terms of honing our lyrics. I think that we live in a country where inspiration is poured. I mean, it, it, it's, it rains down um, on us. And I think that if we were just, uh, we're so busy, mm -hmm. uh, if, if we just were a little more conscious and we stood back, and that's the reason I've taken a break. Stood back and just be a little bit conscious and go, where do I want my music to go? And what do I want my music to say yeah. in, in the next? I think mm -hmm. what your music says is just as important as the beats. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm saying? We know the types, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the music industry isn't easy. You know this better than no, it's most. Not. It's not. You've been in this for 40 years. Yeah. And you've had your fair share of ups and downs. Uh -huh. And preparing for today, I realized that you'd been on the show before, and there you touched on your, alco your alcoholism. Yes. The, the, the troubles that you had dealing you with You battle alcohol. like my mum used to, to get that <laughs> word out. She's got, are you sure you're a la, a la, a la? <laughs> <laughs> um, so when did you realize, first realize, that this was a problem? You know, I think that I first looked up 
the number of the AA 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it took me 10 years to get into the rooms. Um, wow. So I'm celebrating, I'm in my 10th year of sobriety. Yes. And it's, it's been an amazing journey. It's been a, um, something I wouldn't change. It, it, I mean, there's nothing like getting a clap to give you some humility yeah. um, like that. I think that adversity, I think, I think people that have been through no adversity are quite boring, actually. <laughs> I think I do. I think that adversity defines us mm -hmm. and it, it, it crafts us as human beings. And, you know, that's my stuff. Other people are battling yeah. lots, of, you know, you know People battle. Life yeah. is life's tough, and life's also beautiful. At and the same time, it's so, so true. I find that interesting that you say twenty years ago is when it it dropped mm. the realization that I need yeah. to do something about it. But in fact, it took another decade to even act on it. Well, I think what happened was I was too young, and I thought, ah, I'm not going through my life without a party. You know, not realizing that, of course, I could. I'm the last person on the dance floor now. You know, I'm I'm quite wild and. Um, I'm, I, I'm just the designated driver. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Now, whenever we go out, nobody needs an Uber. They just invite <laughs> me. PJs around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it did, I, I started to think, am I drinking too much? Um, so what about the people around you, though? Managers, PR, assistants, nobody ever said, listen, here, this behavior is certainly not you know, becoming, or did they enable it? People are enablers. Um, and it's not their fault because mm -hmm. people don't know how to, they don't know how to approach the situation. They don't know how to say things. Right. Um, my sister was hectically um, uh, uh, sort of, she wouldn't enable anything. She, she took absolutely no nonsense from me. Yeah. And my family were very, very supportive. But until you get it, you, you know, when you get it, you get it. You get it. And yeah. it doesn't matter how many enablers you have out there. Hmm. Um, at the end of the day, drink is not the problem. Yeah. I am. Right. And yeah. I know how close you are to your sister. You guys are so identical. No, you could be twins. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're very close. <laughs> so is she one of the people that helped you in that time? Oh, most to help, definitely. To support you? Most definitely. I had, uh, I had uh, yeah, I had some really close friend, a friend, Marissa, um, Priscilla, I've had, I had a group of people, Victor Masondo was somebody that really, really was steadfast with his support for me. Yeah. And then, you know, you start to, you start to just see this tiny little firefly and, um, it grows bigger and bigger, it grows bigger, bigger, bigger grows and bigger, bigger, bigger and bigger. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So fast forward, right. Yep. And here we are, as you say, you're celebrating 10 years of sobriety this year mm -hmm. and you are back. You're making this unbelievable comeback with your latest release uh -huh. and we'll talk about the music, Walk In My Shoes, a little bit later. But what do you think of now releasing music in this era of social media and all of these eyes that can tend to be on top of you? You know, I think that if we're going to sit and complain, I'm, I'm the eternal optimist. So I think that if you're going to complain and if you're going to go, oh, I can't ever get a moment's peace, blah, 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 well, then get out the industry because I think you will know this, mm. that most celebrities, I hate the word, but if the camera isn't on them, they start to panic terribly, <laughs> immediately, you know, and there's this huge panic. So... Music has changed enormously. Mm, uh, mm, uh, the digital mm. has changed. Um, we, we no longer sell our music. We share our music. Yes. Um, which is, 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 is an adjustment period. At the moment, we're going through an adjustment period. YouTube will eventually start. The money will start filtering through. And it will change. But right. like anything, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a period of change. Mm. And I think we've got to get it out of our heads that record sales, hard copy, is going to give us our money. I mean... Um, yeah, that they sailed years ago. That, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. Um, even, I mean, iTunes is old news. Mm. I mean, as something happens, it's old news. Mm. So now things are streamed, and, um, but now you, what you are is as you release, you're an international artist. Yeah which means that you get invited. I've traveled more around the world in the last four years um, than I ever have in my career. Right. Because you are 
you, you are automatically released into, onto an international platform. Mm, right, so, it's so good to see you. Can't believe how long it's been. Well, it's said that you cannot really understand someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Right, after going solo since the early days as part of the group Hotline, her career boomed as a solo artist who collaborated with many icons. Her 90s hits, There Is An Answer, and All We Need Is Here in Africa, until today, are still loved all over the continent. So after the break, we continue our journey with PJ Powers as she walks us through her activism through Kulisa Social Solutions. Stay right there. get emotional listening to that song welcome back in a letter written by Madiba from prison he described PJ as one of the young people on who the country pins so much hope the clip that you just saw was PJ powers from the 1995 rugby world cup and the song was titled world in union we've come a long way as a nation but of course South Africa still has a longer road to travel in order for us to realize true freedom since PJ started her ambassadorship with Kulisa Social Solutions, she really has embodied being that beacon of hope that Madiba spoke of for so many underprivileged Africans. PJ, we'll talk about the work that you're doing with Kulisa, uh -huh. but I also want to touch on this album a little bit. I'm curious about what we'll find, who we'll find, if we simply walked like 20, 20 steps in your shoes. I think a much, um, a much braver, person than before, yeah. and I wasn't that timid before, a much braver person. I think that the time has come. I think 27 was for complaining, mm -hmm. and I think that 2018 is for doing, and I think that we cannot sit back and, and, and have politicians decide our fate. Mm -hmm. I think that we have got to, as individuals and as um, civilians in our country, if you're not doing something to make South Africa a better place, then quite frankly, please keep quiet. Um, you know, that's if you can't love here, don't live here. And um, that's my, 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 my slogan. Yes, and and that's a quotable quote, by yeah, the way. Yeah, if you can't love here, don't live here. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't go near any of the naysayers. Um, I walk out of dinner parties when people start on about this and about that and the next thing. Yeah. Um, because there is so much good stuff that is happening out there. Mm. There is so many changes there. We have come. People talk about, oh, 20 years we were. I'm like, you know, just, just exhale for a minute and just think about how far we have come. Azania, I'm not sitting here saying that we don't have issues. Mm -hmm. Of course we've got issues. Mm -hmm. We've come out of a very, very dark place. Yeah, 10 years, you know, decade. Uh, yeah, challenges. we've come out of a very, very dark place. But I believe that there is an enormous light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that people should um, give the, the president a chance. You know, let's not... I mean, I, I, it, it amazed me that the DA took a pot shot at him, literally as he was elected, you know, mm -hmm. and and I think that everybody needs to just hamagachi, you know, go slowly, breathe, mm. do what is best for your guy. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. and 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 just take these little steps. We're a damaged nation. Mm -hmm. We're a nation that has been that has been severely, severely. Um, there's a lot of trauma. Trauma. Yeah. We, are, we, are, we are like traumatized children. Mm -hmm. And you know, that trauma lives in your parents. It lives in your parents' parents. Yeah. You know, yeah. And your children will know about this trauma. And we can't just go knocking our, down, you know, <clears throat> a whole lot of, um, it's quite a contentious issue, uh, a whole lot of statues and expect that to now to be the end of our history. We must remember our history. Must do the hard work as well we to must get to where we want we to. We must remember the history. Lest so it happen is that again. what got you to work with Kulisa Social Solutions? Because you joined in 2016. Yeah, and what got me to work is I wanted. I was. I've always been in the in the 
fringed, you know, I've always written socially conscious songs and that sort of stuff. Mm. But I wanted to get some, I wanted to be involved in an NGO that had a lot of traction. This is an NGO that's been going for 20 years. Yeah. It's not some fly by night. Where there's we, measurable impact. Where there's measurable, yeah. we have got data, we have, the, the traction is quick, the, um, the mentorship program is quick. We're in America, we're in um, uh, London, um, we, um, we go over again joining expats because mm -hmm. expats, some of the expats didn't want to leave South Africa. They left because maybe they weren't as strong as you and I to stay, you know, and I think we beat up on them all the time instead of actually just going, you've got a lot to contribute. Come, and this you is know, how you can back do it. Here, you can do it through your mentorship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can do it through um, all sorts of stuff. And I'm working with wonderful children yes, in Cape Town. Oh, and I thought you meant your colleagues within the NGO because you work with Tulima Doncella, right? Advocate, I work with Tulima Doncella. tuli has been um, an amazing... We've joined forces with the Tuma Foundation. Um, incredible woman to work with. Yeah, yeah. Um, very profound. You know, when she... When she opens her mouth, the room goes quiet. Yes, with that soft with power. With that soft, soft power. Soft. You know, whoever said you had to be loud to make your point, she's... Um, yeah, some of us. Yeah. <laughs> You're loud, I'm loud. Yeah. <laughs> so in that kind of company, <laughs> you also... <laughs> Listen to me! Soften up a little but, bit. Uh, she's, a, she's an amazing human being. Right. And, you know, together we can just do... Uh, it, but we can just do all do so our bit. More. Absolutely. And people tell me that I'm... a. Uh, um, you know, that, I, uh, that, that I'm a, uh, an altruist and all of that. Well, you know what? I'd rather actually have that yes. cross to bear yes. than somebody that trudges through life feeling really, really depressed. Absolutely. And I think it's a quality that we don't applaud enough no, in people, that don't. altruistic uh, uh, side of us in mm. order for us to care for one another. Yeah. But has this, or how is this inculcated in you? Was it always just about not doing what what other people were doing, being not conforming to the pressure of what people expected of you. Because even in the 80s, you were this activist musician. Well, I think that what happened was when I first, you know, in, uh, uh, it was the 31st of May, 1982, when I was given the name Utandega at the Jabalani Amphitheater. And I saw firsthand the injustices of the apartheid um, regime and I'm not one of those white people that goes, I bet I didn't know I didn't what was know. happening. Yeah. I didn't know. Well, I mean, uh, you, know, we, you know, couldn't you not read whites only? Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so basically um, I've always been um, a, an activist and, and this new song of mine, Walk in My Shoes, uh, which I've used um, my little group of people, yeah. which we're doing interactive storytelling and getting getting the message across, a lot of young girls, particularly young girls, find it very, very difficult to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And young young boys, but a lot of young girls. So what we're doing is we 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 go we go around the country telling their story, encouraging other people to tell, because when we start to share our stories. Yeah that's when we will move f forward. And we empower other people to be able to tell their own. Absolutely. So is that the thread, the message that's that runs the through the music and, on And the reason I wrote it in the first person was, it's, it's a hi there, I'd like to introduce myself, is because I wanted, mm. um, I wanted to, to, to be as if somebody had walked into somebody that was completely marginalized, completely in dire, dire poverty, walked into a place like this and said, and sat on the edge of your chair yeah. and asked you what you'd done with your day yeah. and how different our days were and how much we could learn from each other. Mm. So what inspired this comeback and why did you take so long? Ah, <laughs> Was it life? <laughs> were you just doing life? I, was, I think I was doing life. I was growing up a little bit. Not that I mean, I, I'm, I'm still like a child, you know, really. Um, Don't lose that, by the way. Don't no, I won't. That. I'll hang on to that child mm -hmm. for as long as I can. I think that, as I said, I, I wanted to stand back and I wanted to go, okay, what is it? What is it that you... And I now know what I want to do with the next five years mm -hmm. of my musical career. I have a trajectory and I want to follow it and I want to plan it and, 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 
and do it as successfully as I can. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's quite a blessing to be in this position. I'm to be very able to blessed. have ears, absolutely, and to bear what's in your heart. Uh, to have ears, to be able to uh, write my own songs, which means that I've been able to live off the royalties mm -hmm. while I've been taking this very long sabbatical. Yeah, and uh, so you know that that sort of stuff. Um, but where I belong is 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 right down there on the ground with the people that that put me where I am. Yeah. No, looking at the work that's been done by the organization, you are a perfect fit. So this album, you'll be performing uh, the single yeah. a little bit later on, really yeah. anticipating that. So who did you work with on it? Any collaborations? I didn't work with any collaboration. I worked with a collaboration just recently with Radio and Weasel, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, Radio passed, and I it see. was a it was a horrible, a horrible, a horrible death. Um, mm. There will be a collab with two beautiful young black men, which I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> um, I, I, well, I just have, um, <laughs> which will be the next song. But um, this one is is I. I suppose I call it my there is an answer because it's a song of hope and it's a song of communication. Good. Well, I can't wait to check you out performing it later. Thank you can't very wait. much. Well, thank you so much to PJ Powers. Make sure you don't miss that performance at the end of the show. You know, with many South Africans celebrating Freedom Day tomorrow, there are some who might argue that white South Africans have always enjoyed freedom in pre- and post-apartheid South Africa. So after the break, the author of Sitting Pretty, White Afrikaans Women in Post-Apartheid South Africa, joins me. The conversation around white privilege in South Africa has been making the rounds more regularly of late. It centers around the idea that white South Africans still benefit more than their black counterparts because of the color of their skin and their historical, political, social, and economic advantages. The guest who joins us now has written a book that explores how the white Afrikaans female has by virtue of being a female been oppressed by society, but in the same breath has played the role of the oppressor purely based on the color of their skin. So please join me in welcoming Christy van der Vestes. And Christy, a pleasure to have you here and congratulations Wonderful. on your book. Wonderful to be with you, Azania. So what was the inspiration for it? I know that you've written around similar themes before within contributing to journals or to your own publications, but why mm. this particular subject? Well, I've, I've written a previous book called White Power and the Rise and Fall of the National Party. Yes. And there I actually looked at the phenomenon of, of class as it intersects with race. And I took a more of a macro point of view. So I actually looked at the past 150 years, but with a focus on the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's why it's also particularly exciting to be here with you today on the eve of Freedom Day. Yes. You know? so, so I looked at the past 30 years, and I looked at those compromises that were also made in the 1990s. And, but, but when you take the macro view, it is sometimes quite difficult to understand why do people feel so compelled to attach themselves to terrible ideologies, mm. you know, such as racism, sexism, homophobia, and, and so on. And I wanted to, it was almost like if you, if you look at it from a macro point of view, you can't completely understand why uh, do, do people get mobilized in mm -hmm. the service of these terrible ideologies. And, and that's what I, what I wanted to try and get to with this, with this book specifically. Yeah, wow. And you start in quite a powerful way by referencing Nelson Mandela. But before we get to that reference and how you further broke it down, was this also part of a self-examination exercise or forcing mm. or encouraging self-examination within mm. the Afrikaner community? I've, I've been, a, uh, I've, in my previous life, I was actually a journalist. Uh, I started off at Freie Werkblatt. Yes, um, which is an anti apartheid uh, publication. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. so, and, and I, but I grew up in Boxburg and at a, at a horrible time in the 1980s. It was interesting to hear earlier when you were speaking to PJ about the, about the 80s, which was truly the most, uh, obviously, um, the, the, most of the 20th century was, was an incredibly um, dark and difficult time. But the 80s were particularly bad because you had an uh, incredible increase in state violence and so forth. And, and where I was living in, in Boxburg, mm -hmm. the Conservative Party City Council had, had just reinstituted petty apartheid and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And as I was engaging, I was still a kid at that point, as I, but, but we were very politicized. So we were arguing around uh, these National Party kids in my, in my, in my class 
uh, Afrikaan weerstandsbeweging, you know, IWB yes. and so forth. And and then there was me, you know, and um, uh, and and and, cons and then the, and the Conservative Party kids, you know. So and we were having these big um, arguments, and I felt at that point in time, you know, as as a lesbian and as somebody who's who's gender non-conforming, I felt quite alienated from these white people. Right. And in my mind, sexism, homophobia, and racism became quite closely connected, and that's why. I, I also adopted the position of, of anti-racism actually from a, from a young age. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, well, as a teenager, and, that, and that's why, you know, I decided to, to go and work at Freiburg to further pursue that, to try and further understand, but um, on the one hand, how racism, sexism and so forth work and to write on it as a journalist and mm -hmm. to analyze it, but also um, to, to, to use it as a platform to confront Afrikaners about our, our history, you know, where we come from, um, both as, a, as a, an exercise in self-reflection, because my grandmother was, was a big National Party supporter, you mm. know, she was a member of the Osova Brandwag, which was a, a neo-fascist organization in the, in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so that's my own history as well. And for me, so it was about grappling with my own history, um, c confronting myself, confronting where I come from, and see if, is there anything good to salvage about right. Afrikaner identity? Right. Or is it all so, um, in a sense, so, so has it become so toxic with racism, you know? That's an interesting question. But first, I want us to explore the position, just the, 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 the positionality, the level of comfort within democracy for Afrikaners. Do you think that they're struggling to find their feet within this democracy? Because so much of this country's history and journey has been informed by Afrikaner, by the Afrikaner community. Well, it's it's uh, it's very interesting to see, and that's something that I write about in my book. Is is how the the competition actually between between the two settler classes, the white English speakers and the white Afrikaans speakers, mm -hmm. uh, to a large extent, actually, I, I believe it was a a pivotal historical factor in in that gave us apartheid. If we didn't have these two compe competing settler classes, yeah, especially after the know. South African War yes. and the atrocities that the Afrikaner mm. people went through, mm. it mm. bolstered their position to resist the English even yes, more. Yes, yes. And in, in, instead of, in a sense, finding common cause with the black people of, of our country, uh, because of, of various um, Racism was 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 really uh, in uh, resurgence as a as, as an ideology in the f first half of the 20th century, worldwide and particularly in the colonial context. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so because of that, colon how colonialism and racism came together in the early 20th century, these Afrikaans speaking whites they were actually more Dutch speaking at that point, but they started to shift towards Afrikaans. They 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 decided to rather opt for whiteness instead of finding common cause with 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 black people in this country, which is. And, you know, one can do interesting historical experiments around what if, you know, what if Afrikaners didn't actually go that route, yes. you know, we would have had a completely different history. Yes, and so even when you look at the history of the ANC and why the formation came about, it was also yeah. because of broken promises around the land and realizing that yeah. with that yeah. South African war, they, uh, the, the, their desires were not going to be, the, the, the things that they hoped for were not yeah. going to come their way. So yeah. it meant organizing for themselves as well. Yes. So yes. let's look at in Ingrid Young the type of Africana woman that she was, and even in how Nelson Mandela referenced her um, in one of his speeches in Parliament and why she's an interesting figure within, uh, if, we, if we are looking at uh, Africana females. Well, uh, she is particularly interesting, and in, in what I found uh, captivating was the fact that, that um, uh, Nelson Mandela raised the, actually in his inaugural speech as our first um, a, a democratic president. Yeah. He actually raised her, her particular poem that she'd written on the you know state violence, and it, it's called the child, the um, the child who was shot dead by soldiers at at, at Nyanga, mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, what 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 Nelson Mandela was basically posing at at that point in 1994 uh, um, was a, a challenge to white people and specifically to white Afrikaans speakers. Uh, look at Ingrid Jonker, look at how she at 
the darkest, one of the darkest periods in, in the apartheid time, really when apartheid was at its height in the 1960s. Yeah. She was resisting, as an Afrikaner woman, she was actually resisting her own father, who was a, a National Party senator and head of the censorship committee. Mm -hmm. She's a poet, so you can now think of that tension there. Yes. And at the same time, she was, she was writing anti-apartheid poetry, you know. And, and this is really that, that time um, when, when resistance had almost been quashed. The ANC was in exile. Internal uh, uh, resistance was at, at, a, at an all-time low. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. here you have a figure like Ingrid Jonker coming up and, and getting that, um, you know, finding that, <coughs> that courage to actually oppose the system. And one should think then under democracy it must be even much more possible, you know, for, for white Afrikaans-speaking women to embrace uh, the, the principles of democracy and to, and to resist these ideologies of, of, of oppression. Right. And, and that's the, the challenge that, that Nelson Mandela actually put to us as, as white Afrikaans speakers. Mm -hmm. And I wanted with my book to try and see, you know, did, did we take up that challenge, you yeah. know? And, yeah. and so that's, that's the focus of the book. Mm. And mm. We're, gonna, we're gonna continue talking about some of the other themes that you touch on. After the break, we go deeper into conversation about our democracy in post-apartheid South Africa through the eyes of Christy. Stay with us. Welcome back. In order to move forward, it's important to reflect on our past. The conversation around freedom and what it means for different members of society is one that can go on for hours. Christy, who is an associate professor of sociology, has spent her career trying to understand society and its problems, and she continues the conversation on the problems of white Africana females through her book, which is right here called Sitting Pretty. Christy, thank you so much for staying with us. Now, let's explore the theme of religion and the role that it's played within the Africana community because we can see how religion was used to oppress and also within the community, how it helped to subjugate women and keep them in their, in their position. Mm. Well, you know, uh, as we know, most religions in, uh, in the world are patriarchal in nature and frequently if you, f if you, at the intersection, for example, of religion and nationalism, mm -hmm. nationalism as an ideology um, can draw on religion to, to justify patriarchal oppression yeah. within that nationalism. And it's interesting, uh, you know, frequently, uh, you know, in terms of the work that I'm doing, the people that I engage with, I'm, I'm uh, frequently in sort of in public situations where I can engage with, with people on these issues and also in my, my columns that I write in the media and so on, the kinds of responses that I get, you see that uh, religion frequently presents a major obstacle for women in terms of confronting patriarchy because th in, a, in a very narrow reading of the Bible, uh, if you now look at the Christian religion, mm -hmm. the, the, um, you have to be subservient to your husband, you know, if you read it very narrowly. And, and frequently women get caught up in that. And then when they're in an abusive relationship, of course, it becomes very difficult for them to leave because they feel I, I must put myself second. I must listen to my husband. He's got, a, in a sense, a direct connection to, to God. Hmm. And, and because that's how, uh, you know, a narrow reading of the Bible would present it to you. Right. But of course, you know, I have to say, um, religion, of course, has been very interesting in South Africa and also elsewhere, because we also had completely different interpretations of the Bible mm -hmm. that have been very liberating, you know, and if we think of liberation theology, for example, mm -hmm. and even in, in, um, for white Afrikaans speakers, you find more and more people actually um, shifting and, 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 and contesting gender and sexual regulations within the churches and so on. For example, now with the NGK, the yes. Dutch Reformed Church, yes. there are people taking the church to court now about gay, um, yes. gays and lesbians in the church and so forth. So there's, and that's what I, what I, what I think is wonderful about our, our democracy uh, in that it allows for the kinds of contestations that you couldn't have dreamt of mm -hmm. during apartheid. Mm -hmm. We have definitely not moved far enough 20 plus years, we still have a lot to do, but the fact of the matter is our democratic dispensation yeah. is giving us that space that we can actually contest. So we can contest oppressive interpretations of religion mm -hmm. to say, no, in fact, 
you know, you do, you're doing a very narrow reading. Right. And wherever you are, we're not just only white Afrikaans speakers, actually, because we're, we're a very, very religious country, very Christian we are, country. We are, you know? and more conservative so. than many of us actually think we are. Mm. So that intersectionality for white Afrikaans women, because there's patriarchy, there's racism, there's classism, uh, and, mm. of course, the fact that you are in that particular body and there's religion. So mm. all of this comes together to influence her role and positionality within society. Talk to me about mm. this conflict and this tension. Mm. Yeah, so intersectionality is a wonderfully powerful theoretical tool that we got from the uh, African-American feminists, mm. which allows us to look at all of these different oppressions how they, in terms of how they work together. And you find that racism, for example, um, can be exacerbated through patriarchal notions, yeah. or heteronormativity can be used to, to exacerbate racism and so forth. Mm. So it's very interesting if you look at this um, particular identity, you will see that the, uh, while there's a, um, uh, you know, a kind of a racist positioning um, towards black people on the outside, you get a lot of disciplining and regulation in terms of, of sexuality and gender on the inside. Right. And that's where the hierarchy, they, so there's a, st a strict hierarchy that must be maintained. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the, uh, since the advent of, of democracy, you see in, in more reactionary circles in, um, among Afrikaners, you see much more of an emphasis on the family and there's this idea of we have to keep this hierarchy of man to woman and adult to child. We have to keep it in place. Right. You know? So you can see how those things, because we have to form a united front. But what's interestingly, uh, interesting there also, it's also used ultimately for racial regulation in the sense that if you are in a very conservative Afrikaner family mm -hmm. and you want to have an interracial relationship, that's of it. course, you, you, you land yourself in a very difficult position. And in fact, I found in my, in my research that many women have to walk away from their families. If they, and also women who decide to, to have um, a child who is black, either through adoption mm -hmm. or through an interracial marriage or interracial relationship, they are, um, uh, not, it's not everybody, but some women are, are excluded. They come into a major point of tension with their families. And many of, the, of them decide to walk away. Yeah. I want to be part of this country, I want to embrace this democracy, I want to be different. Mm -hmm. I want to use the opportunities to be different, to be a better person, to be an ethical person. Yes. And I will not, I will, therefore I won't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually leaving my family behind. Right, and before we run out of time, I want us to explore this concept of urdentlicate, this moral affirming position mm -hmm. to say that I am a decent person and it's a, a, a value within the Africano community. How do you define it and how was it or what was it pre-democracy and post-democracy? So Udentikate is a, is a concept just to try and capture this, this particular kind of presentation that one that you find when you meet uh, uh, many white African speakers, you know, which is a kind of a, it's a physical comportment, you know, yeah. it's like how people actually physically present themselves. Also a question of manners, about politeness, about mm. decency and so forth, you know. So uh, it's this particular way of speaking and so on, of even carrying the body and it's with men and women, not, mm -hmm. not only women. Mm -hmm. And so I was using that term to try and, and capture this identity and, uh, and what, what's interesting is that Afrikaners could use religion during, the, during apartheid to, to justify racial oppression, yes. sexism, yes. homophobia, and so forth. But with the fall of apartheid, they can't do that anymore. And they feel, therefore, that their identity, in a sense, is under pressure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and now it's interesting to see how, how the identity is being maneuvered to try and, and deal with that. So with many people, they're feeling, uh, many Afrikaans, white Afrikaans speakers are feeling shameful about what was done in their, in their name previously, also what they themselves did. Right. Because it's an opportunity also for self-reflection to confront yourself, very, very important. Yeah, I think and of myself as an ordentlich person, and mm. yet I'm mm. a beneficiary of this atrocious or uh, a system that was uh, uh, violating and traumatizing mm. others. Yes. Very interesting concept. but. I want to go back to the initial point that you raised about why people attach themselves to such ideologies. Did you reach a conclusion? Well, it, it's about power, you know, it's about power relationships, power relations and relationships. Mm -hmm. It's actually, if, if you look at the conditions in the early 20th century, it seemed that this particular group of people thought it's better to, to mobilize along racist, sexist and homophobic lines to try and garner power in, in the society right. than, than to, to follow a more ethical route. 
And um, what, I'm, what I'm grateful for, at least, is that through the resistance, the concerted resistance of black people against colonialism and, and apartheid, with the, with the help of very, very few white people, right. but at least there were a few white people, um, we actually managed to overturn that, that terrible system. Mm -hmm. And now we have an opportunity to really affirm ourselves, everybody, Within as, this new context. as human beings. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Christy, I've loved talking to you. I think this is an important book in the history of this country to better help us understand uh, another segment of our society. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Christy was absolutely fantastic. It was a pleasure to have her here, especially on the eve of Freedom Day. So don't forget to drop us a message on our WhatsApp line and our Twitter and Facebook pages. There's a hashtag, Make Your Mark, that is going to be prominent this Freedom Day. And it's this year's Brand South Africa campaign in collaboration with Freedom Park. And if you don't have plans yet for tomorrow, why not head out to Pretoria for intergenerational dialogues? There's a film screening as well as fashion shows all inspired by our constitution. Well, she's been wowing audiences on stages for over 40 years and she's performed for former President Nelson Mandela and the Queen of England amongst other dignitaries. And she's also shared stages with the likes of Ladysmith Black Mambazo, Joan Armatrading, Fela Kuti, Brahuma Sekela, Swisson Nwane, Yusondo, Lord Richard Attenborough, Annie Lennox, and Eric Clapton. Now the moment has finally arrived for our beloved Tandega to take the stage. Tomorrow, by the way, is indeed Freedom Day, so be sure to tune in as we get real about whether we have actual freedom in South Africa. And also, this is my last episode for now on Real Talk. I want to thank all of you from far and close all of you that have shown me love, especially as part of this comeback to television, you've been absolutely amazing. I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you so much for watching. Anila will be back on Monday. Good night. It's good to meet you and I never thought We'd be standing here in the same room to let go of your fears and take a deep look into my eyes you'd find a little piece of you in me don't get me wrong I'm not saying it's all bad When I look around, I have to agree that mostly I'm hopeful for out but sad. So won't you take a walk in my shoes? Together, I know you will understand that we dare to dream. To listen to the stories of your life And if you have the time then I could tell you All about the things I hope to achieve Look up And one day I will shine as bright as the stars Joining hearts together, we'll be a part of what we can imagine we can all be.
like a stranger no more I am ready now to be my best it's time to unlock the We dare to dream. Oh, yes, just take a walk in my shoes. I'm inviting you into my. Take a walk in my shoes.